You guys praised me because I was in local government, and I got to admit, I have a bias toward people who started in local government. Because if you're in local government, it's always got to be tangible. Uh, if people can't see it, touch it, and feel it, then you're not getting elected. Um, local government tends to be, after election day, pretty nonpartisan because the problems are kind of practical problem solving things. And then you also have to be very accessible because people lobby you at the grocery store or, or at the side. But one time when I was mayor of Richmond, a woman ran into the back of my pickup truck on Broad Street in downtown Richmond. And as the policeman was writing her a ticket, she said, I said, I am. <laughs> she started lobbying me while she was in the ticket. <laughs> So, but, but that accessibility, tangible, you know, it's, you got to work together. That is a great thing about being in local government. And I'm a little bit rare. There's only been 20 people in the history of the United States who have been a mayor, governor, and a senator. Wow. Now, now, I don't know. Uh, I, I was going to quickly say no applause because it's a unique and true historical fact, but it's not that great because um, here is the, here is, there is an American politician who has had all of these titles. Mayor, governor, house member, senator, vice president, president. Who is that? Not LBJ, not Richard Nixon, not George Bush. Mayor, governor, house member, senator, vice president, president. The most titled person in the history of American politics, Andrew Johnson, one of the worst presidents in America. So, the mere fact that you have a lot of titles, and, you know, that doesn't mean much, but, but, um, but I've been proud to represent my community, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be here as a local official. My 13 neighborhood associations in my council board, the 2nd District of Richmond, monthly meetings, challenging issues, some of the toughest are, are local issues, even to today, some of the toughest have been local issues, and the fact that you are about self-help and figuring out you know, what you want to do and advance community goals as a neighborhood or as a county, Arlington is known for that. So I'm, I'm thrilled to, I feel like I'm kind of back in one of my local government meetings. I, the lieutenant governor, that's who I was out hiking, Old Rag Mountain, some of you know out here in oh, yeah. Madison County. And I walked into a, gro a little corner store, kind of a country store, and the guy goes, you used to be lieutenant governor. <laughs> and I thought, like, what kind of person, like, really is focused on lieutenant governor? <laughs> and so all I could think to say was, you're right, I did used to be lieutenant governor. <laughs> that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> um, so what, what I want to do really is answer questions that you might have or talk about issues you want to talk about. But let me just say, I've been in the Senate almost exactly a year ahead. And just let me tell you what I'm up to now and kind of put it in a framework. We are, as a nation, in a period of significant soul searching. Soul searching is a good thing to do. It's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. We're in a period of soul searching because of the most significant economic collapse since the 1930s, recession of 08 and 09. And we're in a period of soul searching in our kind of <coughs> armed services foreign relations outlook and relationships at work. Um, because of the end of the longest war in the history of the United States, uh, the Iraq and Afghan wars together, 13 years, um, and, the, and those wars will be over sort of in their iteration. Terrorism remains and the fight remains, but at least the Iraq and Afghan wars will really be over in their current iteration at the end of 2014, and that, that creates the need for some significant soul searching. The reason I bring that up is I came into the Senate and I've been lucky in the uh, committee assignments that I've done. And in the Senate, a lot of your work really focuses on committees. And so I just want to kind of talk about quickly, I'm on the Budget Committee and the Armed Services Committee and Foreign Relations Committee. In all of these areas, we're kind of grappling with this soul searching and direction forward. And I'll just offer a few thoughts about each of these areas, what I'm working on. And then there's an additional soul searching area, which is just kind of about how we do politics, the you know, civility with the small c. Um, democracy with the small d. Um, how do we dialogue with each other? How do we listen to each other? How do we participate in democratic institutions? So I'll say a word about those things. Um, this time in our economic life has been second to none challenging. I'm the only governor in the history of the United States that left office with a, in the history of Virginia, in the history of Virginia, that left office with a smaller budget than the budget historically. 
and, I, and, I, and I'm going to assure you that wasn't my plan. Uh, yeah, um, I, I didn't run, we'll actually shrink the size of the state budget, but that happened because I was governor during the worst recession since the 1930s, and I had to make a whole lot of challenging cuts and learn how to do it. And now we're coming out of this um, economic challenge. The job numbers that were announced uh, just last week were generally positive. They're not roaring, they're not roaring, but they're modest growth, hopefully sustainable. But, but we've seen people get hurt, we've seen people lose jobs, we've seen people lose pensions, we've seen inequality grow, and we're really grappling with what are the strategies to, to see more of a robust improvement. Now, relative to other nations in the world, the U.S. economy is pretty good right now. There are a lot of other places that have significant challenges that haven't climbed out of the recession the way we have. But one of the challenges we had, frankly, is the Article I branch Congress, because when I came into Congress in the Senate in January 2013, there had not been a budget in four years. And the Senate had not passed a budget in four years. And there had not been a budget deal between houses of different parties since 1986. So this thing of kind of normal, what you guys do, you know, budgets every year, and then, you know, making spending decisions and having to make hard ones and hard years, or, we had fallen out of that practice in the Senate. And I believe that just regular decision making, even when they're hard, even when they're not popular, it's better to just do annual budgets, and, you know, regular appropriations bills and not fool around with the debt ceiling. It's just better to do that kind of thing and do it regularly, whether you like all the line items or not, than to just drift with the uncertainty and the anxiety that, that not making decisions. So I'm, I'm happy to say that being on the budget committee, we got our first budget. Um, we actually did a two-year budget rather than a one-year budget because, frankly, we had we had shut the government, allowed the government to shut, them, which was so ridiculous. And we kind of owed people a little bit more, a little more certainty. In the military, what happens is when we don't do budgets, they have the military has to take a lot of their planners who should be planning how to deal with challenges in the world, and instead they're spending their time running five different budget scenarios. When is Congress going to come up with a number, and what's the number? We want our military folks to be planning to meet national security needs, not trying to do cleanups after Congress can do budgets. So the first thing I'm really working on, and those in local and state government know, is just regular orderly budgets, bringing down debt and deficit as a percentage of GDP, not just you know eliminating it. That would be foolish. Um, sometimes you hear people talk about the, the national debt. The way to measure the national debt is really not a number, it's what is the percentage of debt to GDP. That's how we do it at the state level. We, we don't manage state debt with a number. But what is the percentage of interest payments as a percentage of the budget? What is the, the total debt as a percentage of the state budget? And you need to manage, manage the federal debt deficit the same way. So we're working on all those issues, but regular order decision making and compromise you know, which ought to be a good word, one of the great senators in history, Henry Clay, the great compromiser. That was a compliment when it was called the great compromiser. That word is not used as a compliment in politics, and that's unfortunate. Second area of soul searching budget in the economy is, is our outlook to the world. And, uh, you know, being in Virginia, being on the Armed Services Committee is a fantastic example. Now, I had a problem when I was put on that committee because for 36 years before me, the Virginian who was on the Armed Services Committee was both a decorated combat veteran and a former Secretary of the Navy, John Warner for 30 years and Jim Webb, your president, for six years. And so then I got put on, and I'm, I'm not a decorated combat veteran, I didn't, I didn't serve, but if I'd been Secretary of the Navy, I would remember it, so I, <laughs> I get put on armed services and I have big shoes to fill, but it is so exciting to be on armed services, especially at a time of, of soul searching. And, and there's only two senators who have children in the military. And so I'm like so many Virginians. In Virginia, one out of nine Virginians is a veteran, not one out of nine adults, but one out of nine from birth to death is a veteran. And then you add all of our active duty, all of our guard and reserve, you add the DOD civilians like, you know, nurses who work out at Fort Belvoir Hospital, you add the DOD contractors, like the people that build the largest manufactured items on planet Earth, aircraft carriers at the shipyard, you add all their families, like me and my family, now we're talking like one in three of us are directly connected to the military. So working on those issues is incredibly important. But again, we're, we're, we're not in the world we were in. We're in a very different world where the challenges are very different. 
and where it's not just the old days of the Cold War where there was a power of the Soviet Union, a power of the United States, and everything kind of got divided that way. We have to look at challenges all over the globe. Some of them are states, but more of them are not states. They're terrorist organizations or, or criminal international drug running syndicates that can run other stuff too, other than drugs, human trafficking or even uh, a weapon. And so the, the challenges that we face in the armed services side of the future, in armed services, I'm focusing on two things. Rewriting the War Powers Resolution of 1973, and Senator McCain and I have introduced a bill to do that because we feel like President's overreach and Congress is like to abdicate their responsibility and not vote, if at all possible, on these most important questions. And we want to make sure that the initiation of military hostility will always reflect a national consensus between the executive and the legislative branch that the mission is worthwhile. Because if you don't do the hard work of reaching a consensus, if you let Congress, for example, just not vote, just let the president start stuff, then we're asking men and women to potentially risk their lives without the political class having done the hard work of defining what the mission is and having given us some definition. So, so this is the issue in armed services that I'm most passionate about. I think there are a lot of lessons over the last 13 years that could that could help us uh, do that. The <laughs> work I am on is foreign relations, and I, I talked my way on. You're not supposed to be an armed services and foreign relations here. I talked my way on because I'm fluent Spanish. <laughs> and, 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 you know, so, I mean, that's foreign relations enough. Okay. okay. Um, but, but after I had been on the committee for six months, and this is the way things happen in the Senate, I got appointed the chair of the subcommittee overseeing the Middle East. <laughs> so, now, why does a freshman get appointed to be the subcommittee chair over the Middle East? Because nobody else wants to. <laughs> this is like the life serial number. Let Mikey try it. And that's, pretty much, that's pretty much what happened. But I am passionate about American foreign policy. I've traveled to the Middle East as a mayor and governor. Um, I've now been to the Middle East three times since becoming subcommittee chair. The Middle East in the Senate parlance is pretty broad. It's Marrakesh to Bangladesh. So that's, it's the traditional Mar Middle East, Arab North Africa, the Levant, the Arabian <coughs> Peninsula, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, um, um, India, Bangladesh, and the five Central Asian, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, and Tajikistan, the five stands. So it is a huge chunk of, of territory, but territory that is where some of our strongest allies are, where some of our most challenged relationships are. And, um, and it's been exciting to, 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 to be there, but, but what the real work of the Foreign Relations Committee is, is what is the role, the big picture role that America wants, America wants to play in, in the world. I mean, we obviously played a, a very important leadership role in the world in the 20th century. The 20th century was a moment where some things consp conspired together, converged together for the United States. The, the U.S. economy became the largest economy in the world in 1890. The U.S. military became the largest military in the world in about 1900. And then Teddy Roosevelt got involved and brokered the end of the Russo-Japanese War and won a Nobel Peace Prize in 1905. So within 15 years, largest economy, largest military, a peacemaking nation willing to work on peace deals on things that didn't really affect us directly, but that we felt like we had a, a moral obligation to play a peacemaking role. And the convergence of those three roles of diplomatic strength Military strength, economic strength, was what produced this amazing role for the United States uh, in the 20th century. Well, now the 21st century is different. Um, in the 21st century, as I said earlier, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had a foreign policy, the Truman Doctrine, that kind of defined virtually everything. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, we went through about 10 years of kind of ad hoc decision making. And that sometimes is exactly the right thing. Since 9 11, our foreign policy has been the war on terror, but that is not a big enough foreign policy for a nation as great as ours. And so, as, the, as that 13 years of war is coming to an end, and we're looking at the 21st century, is going to be different than the 20th, but we play our right role when we try to balance diplomatic strength, economic strength, and military strength, and strength of our moral example. And we tend to kind of play the wrong role when we lean too hard on one or the other and don't try to balance our force. So trying to find a balanced um, you know, package of, of strength across these spheres is what we're doing as we sort of soul search and define that leadership role. And the world still needs it for us. Um, some people say America's kind of shrinking back from the world. I don't think we are. Look, 
the world still needs our example of tolerating a free press because there are plenty of nations in a lot of different continents in this world that are throwing journalists in jail even today, trying to even today. The world still needs the nation, the, the example of religious tolerance that we practice there in neighborhoods in Arlington and Richmond where people live next to each other who have in their in their in their home countries they would not be living next to each other, they would be in significant challenge, but we offer to the world an example of religious tolerance. So the world still needs that, we still offer that. We made huge strides in the recognition, protection, and celebration of relationships regardless of sexual orientation, and people are still getting thrown in jail or, um, or punished around the world because of, you know, because of their sexual orientation. We stand as an example for that. We stand as an example for innovation. We stand as an example for a lot of educational practices and achievements. Now, there's things we can learn, and we can't be so heuristic to think we can't learn from anybody. There's things we have to learn, but we still have an awful lot of an example uh, to show the world. And so in that foreign relations space, you know, some people say Americans and me kind of sound busy about it. Like nobody else can solve anything unless we get in the middle. But I do think we can be the exemplary nation. And frankly, you're a lot more likely to be indispensable if you try to be exemplary than if you try to be indispensable. And so if you try to be exemplary, then you can. Um, the last thing I'll say is we're also in a period of soul searching, and, and I feel like in each of these other areas we're making some progress after some tough times abroad, tough times economically. An area where I'm a little more, not pessimistic, but still, I don't know, I've got a question mark after it is this sort of the civic dialogue. So people in this room have different political points of view and things like that, but you can come together and figure out what to do for your neighborhoods. And we've always been that kind of country where, you know, I got plenty of people of all political persuasions in my family. My wife's dad was a Republican governor, he's still my political hero. So um, we ought to be able to learn together. I believe in the Venn diagram theory of politics. Republicans certainly believe this, and Democrats believe this, and independents believe this. And if you spend your time working in the intersection, you'll get a lot done. If everybody just stays in the places that don't intersect, it'll be a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. But, but if you can be in that Venn diagram overlap, then you're going to accomplish it. But, but, you do see an awful lot uh, here and in Richmond. I mean, who would have thought that the federal government has a budget? Virginia doesn't. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but you, you, you do see at a lot of places. Um, you know, the hard-edged, you know, my way or the highway attitude. The, the media, the way media is done these days kind of pushes people to the side with redistricting, the way that's done kind of, you know, um, um, polarizes the electorate. And so what we need is just some basic civility that, of the kind that all of you learned by about the fourth or fifth grade. And one of the things that's been surprising to me coming into the Senate was that dysfunction that I would have assumed was partisan. That's still you know, significantly true, but much more of the dysfunction you see in Congress is actually poor communication skills. People don't spend the time listening to each other. People don't kind of know kind of some of the basics about getting along in groups. It's, it's, all, it's more that sometimes than partisanship, which is bad in a way, but good in a way. It's good in this way. Um, you know, I, I'm actually going to an event uh, later tonight with a couple of senators, Republican Senator Saxby Chambliss. Now, Saxby Channel's from Georgia. He is older than me. I'm not going to convince him to change his partisan view of the world, or his basic philosophical outlook. And he's probably not going to convince me to. So to the extent that our political views are different at this point in our lives, we're not going to dramatically change each other's points of view. But to the extent that um, we can communicate better, that's something I can do better tomorrow. I can communicate better with anyone tomorrow, and suddenly you find um, you know, you communicate and listen to people, you find common cause and common ground that you might not have known. Um, I learned this as a governor of two Republican houses and a Republican speaker, Bill Howe. We disagreed 80% of the time on things that matter to me deeply and on things that matter to him deeply. But we were friends and we listened to each other, and then we ended up finding surprising things that we had in common that we wouldn't have known if we didn't spend the time together. What I learned from that is really a life lesson as much as a political lesson. Um, Differences can be obvious. Similarities can take more time to unearth. But you got to take the time to unearth them. Or you, you know, you stay in the world. Of the I really appreciate Stan the chance to come and, and offer a few words, and I'm, I'm really happy to.
to maybe take a few questions and uh, or, or take take your advice or suggestions. And right as you think about what you might ask me or suggest, let me do a couple of introductions because I have a really important guy here, Joe Montana. Where's Joe? Joe is Joe runs my Northern Virginia office. So obviously, if you're in Arlington, the fastest way to find